Hey out there. Thanks for, um, thanks for being with us on a Thursday evening. This is, um, this is going to be really fun tonight. I, I have a kind of personal investment in this interview because I've wanted to ask Larry Renee Thomas a lot of questions over the last year. So now I just get to, I get to do it in front of you. Um, uh, Larry, we, we made some mistakes in your bio that you were, you were very quick to point out. Uh, <laughs> and we, we, we said that you were, um, that you grew up on the north side, but in fact, that is not true, is it? No, I grew up on the south side. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, um, my father grew up on the north side. Mm -hmm. but I grew up on, on Rice Street between 12 and 13, on South 12 and South 13. Ironically, the, the barn, which I guess we'll talk about later on, was located right around the corner mm. on uh, 11th mm. and Mayors. And as a, as a child, I would notice this, these ruins. And I, it was a, a fairly nice sized building. And I would always ask my father, what was that building once? He said it was it used to be a nightclub called The Barn. Mm. Mm. And a lot of big bands appeared there during the, third, during the 40s and the 50s. Count Basie, Lionel Hampton, a lot of folks appeared there. So I grew up on the south side gotcha. of Market Street. All right, all right. Let me finish um, introducing you before we okay before we go too deep. Um, you you have written on a range of subjects that are that are um, directly connected with the Black history of Wilmington. Um, you you. Um, you wrote the true story behind the Wilmington 10, um, which is kind of the first um, thoroughgoing book on that, and a, and a fictional account of the Wilmington 10 incident called Rabbit, Rabbit, Rabbit. Um, and then uh, you've written um, a somewhat stranger and more eccentric jazz story, um, which I'm not going to, uh, I'm not even going to give them the title because it's sort of already spoils it a little bit, but toward the end of the talk, I want to get you to tell that story, another jazz story connected with, with Wilmington. Um, but you have, um, you've also uh, had a, a jazz show, um, a classic jazz show. Um, you don't actually live in, in Wilmington anymore. You live, um, you know, in, in closer to Chapel Hill and, um, we can talk about maybe starting up a jazz station here in Wilmington, but I want to thank you for, for being with us. And mm -hmm. um, I want to thank UNCW and the Equity Institute for, for hosting this series and making it possible for us to. My pleasure, man. Let's, um, let's start off. Uh, it occurs to me that if you were to stop a person on the sidewalk and, and ask them what they know about um, the jazz history in Wilmington, it's it's kind of a blank for most people, but in fact, in, in fact, there is a lot, um, a lot there, and and what's there is important to the history of jazz. So, um, where do you where do you start with that when you when you're doing your thinking about it? Well, first of all, I, I live in Chapel Hill. I, I'm actually you're actually in Chapel Hill. Oh, okay. I thought I thought so you were second, outside of it for some reason. No, secondly. Um, I'm one of those persons who came to Chapel Hill and got stuck and keep bouncing back, you know. Because um, I, I live in Chapel Hill because there are signs of intelligent life. Hey, easy. <laughs> you need that, you know. Easy so, uh, First of all, I don't call this music jazz. I call it American classical music. Jazz is a racist term. It's really short for jackass. Mm. And that term was given to that term, that name was given to this music by, uh, in my opinion, New Orleans aristocrats when they visited the whorehouses in New Orleans. And, and they heard these Africans playing music. So they said, oh, that's nigger music. Mm. So one of the most civilized brethren of the group said, don't call it that, don't call it nigger music. So they said, okay, we'll call it coon music. He said, that's still not a nice thing to call it. So they called it jungle music. If you listen to, if you look at some of Duke Ellington's music, uh, some of his older records, recordings, 
You notice it says Duke, Duke Ellington and jungle music. Mm. So jungle music didn't quite stick. So they changed it, eventually changed it to jackass music, J hyphen A S S. And if you notice that the very first jazz recording was by the old Dixieland jazz band, J A S S. Right. Eventually they dropped the S S and they called it jazz, J A Z Z. Most of the ja most of the jazz musicians, and I'll use the word jazz in American classical music while I'm talking tonight, but I use jazz so people would understand what I'm trying to say. Most of the American classical musicians don't call it that. Mm. If you sit around, I'm one of the cats who can sit around the dressing room. I'm a non-musician, and and they you know they just talk talk, and I'm like a fly on the wall. You know, I, I can listen in on what they're talking about. Duke Ellington never called it jazz. He called it Negro folk music. I was interviewing Ahmad Jamal once, the piano player. And after the gig, I went up to his hotel and I interviewed him. And I said, how long have you been playing jazz? And he, cr he cringed up, he frowned up at me. And he said, well, I don't call that what I do jazz. I said, well, what do you call it? Mm. He said, well, I call it Afro-American classical music. Mm. So I guess my point is this name was given to this music by somebody else. In other words, the musicians don't call it that. I see. You see, but to answer your question, Wilmington, you have to look at what, where Wilmington is situated on the map. It has always been a cultural center. It's always been a place where the people who live in this region would come for culture, whether it be dance or plays, and a lot of that is still going on. You notice Stalin Hall has been around for a long time. Stalin Hall was always used as a place, and, and it's, Thaler Hall is built like a, a European opera mm. house. Very elaborate place, Thaler Hall is. And it's all, Wilmington has always been the entertainment center, the cultural center for this area of North Carolina. So, it's, and, and one of the things I, I, I used to get in discussions here in college, when I was in I went to undergrad at North Carolina Central University. And I would get into serious discussions with some of my classmates about Wilmington. It's basically an urban area. We, we don't, I, they will talk about tobacco farms and mm. farming, but it's not a farming area. It's an urban, urban area. You know, if you notice, Wilmington has Gray Street, Chestnut Street, Market Street, and a lot of these streets are similar to the streets that are in Phil, uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. take a, so my point is, it's an urban center. And it's always been a place where people have, have congregated to, have come to for culture and for entertainment. And if you, up and down, do it before the Civil War, before, before in the antebellum days, in the early days of, of the founding of the town, it, it was known as a place where the pirates would go up and down Front Street. They would come, come and party. This is, Wellington was a place where there were, there were a lot of, where you could come and have a good time. Mm. So my, I guess my point it was that, that, that would have included popular music in the, in yeah, the saloons. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. My father, my father was was a um, was a connoisseur, was an American classical music connoisseur. He was a mailman. When he would come home from work, the first thing he would do would take off his clothes and fix, fix himself a drink, and he would put Count Basie on. He would put Sarah Vaughan and Billy Eckstein. So we grew up listening to this. He also had a friend, his name was Walter Best. He was a trumpet player. Mm. Walter Best had a beret on just like Dizzy Gillespie. And he, would, he would always walk around with his case, trumpet case all the time. He was a Miles Davis man. So my point is I grew up around this, grew up around this music. Uh, and so one of the points I try to make to people and people don't understand what this music is all about because I've been very lucky because I was exposed to this music. If you're not ex exposed to it at a very early age, then it's very difficult for you to understand where it's coming from. It's the most sophisticated music in the world, created by the most sophisticated people in the world, African-Americans. See what I'm saying? So my father actually played in a big band when he was in college. He went to North Carolina College for Negroes. He was in, in college in the, in the mid forties. And Walter Best, the trumpet player, led a big band on, the, on that campus, mm -hmm. right? My father thought he was Billy Eckstein. He tried to sing like Billy Eckstein. 
but Mr. Mr. Best actually knew all these arrangements and everything, and he, you know he had a big band. So when 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 the big bands would tour after they got out of college and whatnot, and he moved back to Wilmington, Mr. Best actually set up a club that was in the same neighborhood where my 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 my, my where I grew up. I grew up on 12, 1210 Wright Street, between mm. 12 and 13. And it was actually a, a little store right there on the corner where they would have jam sessions till three or four o'clock in the morning. This is in the, I guess in the mid forties, the late forties, right? So there's always been music there. There was also a club uh, in, in Wilmington called Del Morocco. Mm -hmm. And that club was up on Dawson street. They would have jam sessions there, but the main club during the thirties, the forties and the early fifties was the barn. The barn. On 11th and Mayes. Mm. And it actually, my understanding is actually what looked like a barn. Um, there was actually a club on, on a dance hall. They weren't called clubs, they were called dance halls because people danced to the music in those days. They danced to, to American classical music, jazz music. The big bands were performed, 18 piece big band. And these young people would get up and dance. You, in, your, in your book, you have these amazing pictures of the barn. Yeah. Um, maybe we should share them with the folks out there. I, I, that, was, be great. I thought they were they were kind of breathtaking. So this is a, um, a jazz and blues club, the the club in Wilmington between what years, just to situate it. Uh, maybe the late the mid to late 40s to the early 50s. I understand it kind of died out in the 1950s. Oh, so it only lasted about a decade. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had the pleasure of talking to the owner's uh, granddaughter. I interviewed her. She said yeah. Lionel Hampton was a regular. <laughs> and Louis, Louis Armstrong was a regular too. She showed me a contract of Lionel Hampton and Joe Glazer's signature was on there. And so was Lionel Hampton. 18 piece band for 1800 bucks. <laughs> So we had this this club here in Wilmington, and Louis Armstrong was regularly. He was a regular. And you said that the ruins of it were still kind of around when you were young. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the barn. Yeah, that's the um, inside of the barn. So would they have? Would the musicians have been up on that raised platform there? Um, I can't. I think that's the balcony, maybe. Mm, mm. Yeah. I think there's another that's, one maybe that shows the, 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 where people played. Okay, is you have a, a, there's another photo that yeah. actually has the, yeah, it has the barn there. Yeah, that's the stage. This is the stage here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you see that where they have the barn. And one of the things I noticed, I got this photo from, her name is, what's name, her name, I don't think she's living now. Her name is Jerry Lemon. She was the granddaughter of the Wittits who owned the barn. And she gave me two photos. And one of the things I noticed was that there were American flags. And I, when, I, when I showed them to my pops, my dad, I said, what's with the flags, man? I said, well, <laughs> why would they have American flags in a, in a nightclub? And he said, all right, don't try to start nothing. <laughs> so he said that um, it was during the World War, War years. You know, they were very patriotic. So this was a, a way to show that that they were patriotic, you know, and and during that time, the the African Americans. That's my father. There, he's flirting with the the owner of the barn. This is Mrs. Carrie Whitted. Mm. My father was always a sharp dresser, and he's flirting with her. Um, he was always always he was always at that club. He was always talking about the barn all the time. He'd burn your ears off at the barn. Mm. Uh, sometimes he he was he would watch TV, and we'd see these musicians like Joe Williams and all these other big time musicians appear on, on TV. And he would say, oh, I've seen them before. My father, um, he never went to New York to live. All of his brothers and sisters, he hated New York. All of his brothers and sisters uh, went to New York and Chicago and they had tragic lives up there. So he was the baby of the family. So I would ask him, I said, well, where did you see Count Basie and Duke Ellington and all these people, he said, I saw him at the barn, right around the corner. Fabulous place. 
it, 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 well, there was another club I was about to mention about there was another dance hall on the right on Riceville Beach called the Lumina. Mm -hmm. But the Lumina burned down. It was a uh, it was for Europeans. The white folks went there. You know, I, 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 um, dance hall, right? Big open dance hall. Yeah, yeah. They would go down there and dance, but, but it burned for some reason, caught a fire. There's always fires in Wilmington for some, for some strange reason. Yeah, it's a tradition. So anyway, they, <laughs> they, they, my understanding is that Mr. Whitted either worked for the people who had the Lumina or knew the people who had some connection to the people who, who owned the Lumina. And my understanding is some of the structure from the Lumina was used to build the barn. Mm. That's how the barn came about. I don't know if that's the true story. And I, I, I asked several people about it, and they seemed to think that that was the case. Interesting. But you, mean they, you mean they transported the actual materials over? Some of it. Yeah, some of it. Yeah. But you can tell from, by looking at the interior that it was a fairly nice place. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and it would all, it would all, my understanding is the place would always be packed. Wow. Packed to the gills. And everybody would dress do you, up. Do you have certain shows your dad told you about, or were there certain shows for him that were highlights? Oh, his man, he liked, he liked the big bands. Hmm. His favorite was Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Lungsford. Jimmy Lungsford band of the 1930s and the 19, the late 1930s, a very popular band. They had a tune called, Take What You Do is the Way That You Do It. <laughs> that was a hit tune. Jimmy Lanza was a very interesting guy too. He um he went to Fisk University. He was a graduate. A lot of these people were college, either college graduates or they had gone to college. These were college educated people. Jimmy Lanza was teaching at, at Alabama AM, uh, Agricultural and Mechanical School, it was known at that time, in Montgomery, Alabama. I think it's called Alabama State University now. And he was this master musician. He was just very gifted. And some of his students were gifted students too. So he decided to quit teaching and take his band on the road. 18 piece, 18 piece band. I mean, these cats were dressed, man, dressed to the nines. Mm. Making a lot of money, a pocket full of money. They had their own bus, traveling all over the country. He died mysteriously in Oregon, at a beach in Oregon. He went to a restaurant. I guess he was flashing his money, he had on nice clothes and whatnot. And the story was he had a heart attack and died. But the real story from my, my understanding from talking to some of the cats was that the owner of the club, who was a European, a white cat, was jealous of him and he poisoned him. Mm. So I don't know if that story is true or not, but Jimmy Lunkson, the Jim, my dad liked the Jimmy Lunkson, he liked the big bands. Jimmy Lungsu, he's crazy about Count Basie. Where would these musicians stay when they when they were playing? Well, of course they had they had to stay in different homes. Oh, okay, okay. This is where the Green Book comes into play, right? Excuse me. This is where the Green Book comes into play, right? Right, right. We have right. a we have a young woman historian here in town, Letty Shoemate, who um, has given a couple of talks on. Wilmington and the Green Book, and because of this amazing fact that um, Wilmington, at least at one time, had more entries in the Green Book than any other place. And for, for those of you who don't know what that is, it was an, an um, automobile guide for African American travelers um, who, who wanted to know where it was safe to go, where it was safe to stay. And um, so I, I, I just, I was wondering if any of those, you know, I, I was trying to imagine Louis Armstrong staying in somebody's house. Well, they did. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a place that's still in, in function on, on 6th Street between Red Cross and Grace. It was called Payne's. I think it's still called Payne's. Uh, I think this, that place still functions as a rooming house. Mm. But the Widders had a real nice house on 7th Street. It's still there. Uh, if you're going toward Dawson Street on 7th, South 7th Street between Worcester and Queen. Now they had to give that house up after the Wits passed, their granddaughter invited me over there and she showed me all these photos and everything. And we talked about the barn. I actually uh, wrote a piece about that and I, um, I interviewed her. I got the tape around here somewhere. Um, and she said that most of the, lot of, because it was a big house, 
a great deal of the musicians stayed there at their home. Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Alan Hampton stayed there. Mm -hmm. She told me this story once because she was very young when these people were staying there. That one morning she heard somebody singing in the bathroom while they were shaving. She didn't know who, who the person was, but she later found out that it was Billy Eckstein mm -hmm. <laughs> singing, singing in her bathroom. Fascinating story. That's, that's too good. Yeah, fascinating. Let's let's pivot slightly and start talking about the Heath brothers um, a, li a little bit, and and they're they're obviously central to the story of of Wilmington Afro American classical music, as I intend to call it from here on out. Good. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> so. Sorry. Um, no, I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Percy Heath. I mean, once you say he was the bassist for the modern jazz quartet, you know, what more do you need? So if he's coming out of this place, then this place is vital to the tradition in some in some way. So who who, who were they? Who were the who were the uh, the Heath brothers? Well, the the um, their father was born in Wilmington. The father, Percy Heath Sr. was born in Wilmington. So um, he married a lady from Sumter, South Carolina. You have to understand that Wilmington was a magnet. It, it's a, it, it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad was, it was functioning at that time. And what happened was the people, it's like a migration, a migration, they were migrating from South Carolina. A lot of these people, that were moving to Wilmington were from South Carolina. Mm. Jimmy's, um, J Percy and Jimmy's mother migrated from Sumter, South Carolina, which is actually where my grandfather's from Sumter, South Carolina. And they married, Percy was born in Wilmington, I think in 19, I wanna say 1923. Yeah, I wanna say around that time. Um, and shortly afterwards, they moved to Philadelphia. Jimmy was born in Philadelphia. Now there's a there's, the Tootie was there's a 12 years difference between Tootie and Percy. Now what happened when Jimmy and Percy and their family moved to Philadelphia was uh, apparently the old man came into some kind of hard times, you know, their their pop so they decided, well, what happened? Let me, let me say this. Every summer they would come from Philadelphia, Jimmy and Percy, to Philadelphia to stay in Wilmington because they, you know, they wanted to get away from Philadelphia. And they always talked about walking around the streets of Wilmington barefooted. <laughs> like that was a big deal. But they were very, very proud because their grandfather, uh, the, apparently their grandfather was married to their grandmother because mm. his name was Fisher. He had Fisher's Grocery, which was located on Mc, McCray, which is Mc, McCray Street, uh, off of Red Cross, what is now Red Cross and R Rankin Street, Red Cross Street. Fisher's Grocery is still there. And I mean, they were really proud of that because, you know, this is a, a black man during the 20s and the 30s who had his own store. And they, they would always talk about the fact that their grandfather had a credit line with the school teachers. You know, <laughs> the school teachers would come by then because at that time being a school teacher was, was a fairly good, you know, decent job if you were an Af African American, you know. So the school teachers had a tab. And Jimmy and Percy would always come home, always come to, they considered Wilmington their second home. Mm. They would always come. Yeah, to this, is, this is what I, um, that was one of my questions for you because I, I had known that there was some kind of connection between the Heath brothers and right. Wilmington, but normally the kind of, you know, right. Wikipedia sort of bios that you see make it sound like it was very slight, like they, Percy was born here and then within a year they moved. But in reality, they had this ongoing connection yes. with the city and it was important to them in a musical way, right? Well, they love, yeah, well, they love Wilmington. They considered Wilmington they considered Wilmington their second home. But what, what, what I was about to say was one summer, Percy told me 
that his grandmother said, well, why don't you just stay here and go to school? And Percy said that his grandmother bribed him by, by promising him a, a bicycle. <laughs> That's what he said. But you have to understand, they were, you know, I'm, there were hard times in Philly, man, for these cats. So they, you know, they, I mean, it was a lap, almost like a lap of luxury, luxury being in Wilmington. And we should First he graduated from Wilson in 1940. Mm -hmm. He went to Wilson Industrial High School. He only went to the 11th grade. And if you talk to people from that generation, they remember Percy. They said he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. He was a mathematical whiz. He was the class president. Well, he probably, he was, but he was second in his class. They gave it to somebody. My mom always talks about the fact that he was he was second in his class, but they gave it to somebody else because that was he was a salutatorian or valedictorian or something. Mm. But he was brilliant. Jimmy graduated in 1943. They went to high school in Wilmington. Mm. Both of them graduated from Wilmington Industrial High School. Jimmy learned a trade, right? Carpentry. Mm. Matter of fact, I used to go to Jimmy's house. He lived in Corona, Queens, New York. And I always go by his apartment and he said, see that table over there, man? I made, I made that table. That's what I learned how to do at Williston because they didn't want you to be anything but do industrial hmm. things at Williston. But he also played in the marching band there. Well, right? what happened was, uh, see, their parents were very musical. There's an album that you should get. It's called Marching On. And they have a, a, on the front cover is a photo of his mother and his father, his father's holding the, the uh, clarinet. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy always talks about the fact that his father would pawn his clarinet every weekend and would, would get it out. I think he played with the Elks band or something. Yeah. But their, their, their family, their father and their mother almost demanded that everybody in the family learn an instrument. They learned to play piano. Percy learned to play piano. Their, their sister learned to play piano. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, when it got time for him to learn an instrument, he always told it, they're very funny guys, very humorous guys. They could have been comedians easily. Uh, what happened was he said they had a band, a, a piano teacher, who whenever you play, you would play the wrong note, he would hit you on the hand with a ruler. With a, with a ruler. And so when it, when it got ready for Jimmy to get an instrument, he said his daddy, the, back, the piano teacher's name was Mr. Pugsley. And so his dad said, well, Jimmy, what do you want? What instrument do you want to learn how to play? And Jimmy said, well, it won't be the piano because I don't want Mr. Pugsley hitting on my, my hands all the time. So he chose <laughs> the horn, right? So his father sent him his horn when he decided he wanted to join the band at Wilson. Mm. He started playing his instrument in Wilmington, in the Williston Band. Mm. And they won all kinds of competitions. And he actually, they started a jazz band called the Jazz Barons at Williston Industrial High School. One of the band members was the man I mentioned earlier, Walter Dip Best, who was a trumpet player. Let's, um, let's share, um, I know at least one of the images you sent me was of um, one of those, uh, the Melody Barons, right? Was that? Uh, I, Oh, either the jazz barons or something. I think, like I think they're they're advertised under both names at different. Really? Okay, I'd like to see that. Um, and 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 that was a that was a Wilmington band. And and while I'm looking for the image, I I, I think I learned from you that one of the um, music teachers that at least Jimmy studied under at Williston had played with Count Basie. Uh, I'm sure I don't, I don't, I can't, I'm sure he did. Yeah, it's probably in the book, probably in Jimmy's book, probably mentions it. Um, the book, um, I Walk With Giants, it's Jimmy's book. It's right. probably in there. Um, yeah, well, no, it's just another, guys, another a lot of very good people, get very gifted people, man, very talented people. There's another guy who started at Wilson, played in Wilson's band, who was very musical, named Andy McGee, who, who later taught saxophone at Berkeley College up in Boston, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He played with Lionel Hampton too. A lot of cats didn't play with Lionel Hampton because Lionel Hampton was, was known as a bad paymaster. He didn't like to pay people. He would often get the money and wouldn't pay anybody anything. And they would say, well, we're gonna go to another band. And Hampton said, well, there ain't no other band. I'm the only band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but Jimmy graduated from Williston Industrial High School. Incidentally, his nickname was Jeep. Mm. Very short. Okay, what are we showing here now? Because he, oh, he was short and fast, right? I can't see it. Uh, the Melody Barons, yeah. Where is it? From the regular weekly radio um, broadcast from the USO at 2nd and Orange Streets, Wednesday from 8.15 to 8.45 p.m. will feature the Melody Barons, a Negro oh, nice nine-piece nine orchestra. The Melody Barons have attained rising popularity since they were organized about two years ago and have recently been playing at a nightclub at Wrightsville Beach until blackout regulations called a halt to its operation. So this is during World War II. Interesting. 1943. Wonderful. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, you know, it, it just, that, that, that alone, um, immediately, you know, makes the whole question of how Wilmington fits into the jazz tradition a lot more interesting and, and consequential because they, they went on. Shelton was a member of, uh, was, was, uh, was in Jimmy's class. Now, this is 1943. So let me see, Jimmy came out in 45. So Jimmy is in that band. I may have said Jimmy came out in 40. My parents came out in 43. Mm -hmm. Lee Shelton is a doctor now, was a doctor down in Wilmington. His father was, um, uh, was a mailman and Lee, uh, Lee, Lee Shelton was a very good friend of Jimmy's. He, he, I, if he's still living, he was in Atlanta. Jimmy eventually moved to Atlanta and he was talking about Lee Shelton all the time. But when, when Jimmy left Wilmington in 45, he, um, he started playing with uh, some big bands who actually came to, to Wilmington and played at the barn. And he told me that he stayed with his grandmother when he came down. He actually came back and played yeah. at the barn after he'd gone, the barn. gone up there and made his name. Well, he, started, he actually started a big band when he went back to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, very gifted guy. Um, and one of the members of his big band was John Coltrane. What? Yeah. John Coltrane and, John Coltrane and Jimmy graduated at the same time at 45. John Coltrane graduated from high school, William Penn High School in High Point. Um, he was born in um, Hamlet, North Carolina. But right. both of John Coltrane's grandfathers were ministers. And one of his grandfathers was, they were Methodist ministers. One of his grandfathers had to move, they moved to High Point. And that's what Train basically grew up was in High Point. So that would have been, that would have been kind of an early period in Coltrane's career, right? Yes, yes. He, he moved to, my understanding was Coltrane graduated May 31st, 1945 from William Penn High School. And on June the 1st, he got on a train and went to Philadelphia. The next day, he got, mm. he got out of Dodge. <laughs> Percy Heath was, was a really um, complicated character, right? He, I mean, he did so many, so many things in his life. And, and didn't he take up bass relatively late? Yes, yeah. He uh, he was a Tuskegee Airman, a lieutenant, a lieutenant in the in the, in the army, in the Air Force, I guess. Um, Jimmy was very proud of the fact when when uh, when uh, Percy came home from came home to Philadelphia on his first leave, he had on his uniform, and he and every uh, everybody since since that since that time would call him uh, the officer, the lieutenant. Percy, he, that was a big thing for an African American to have a to wear a uniform, and uh, especially during the '40s and the late '40s, that was a really big deal. You're talking about at that time. You know, I like to, to break things up. The post 1945 era reflects the music and it reflects the culture of the African American. You know, we're talking about the quote unquote new Negro because they had gone overseas and and they had fought in the war. Some of them had been killed during the war, and so they came out with this new this awareness of themselves and they came back with this uh, more self-confidence. This is a- they took, is, that, they took that forward into- Yes, the into the music. Right when they started getting really intense about it. Yeah, the music, the music became more, more, for lack of a better word, sophisticated. 
But I like to tell people that the, the music, the, the, the pre-1945 music, and I'm not the only one who came up with this concept. Um, a lot of scholars have come up with the concept. But, um, the, the, the music of the pre-1945 era moves like a choo-choo train. You know, it moves like a choo-choo. If you notice, the big band sound like a choo-choo train. But once you, yeah. get past, yeah. once you get past um, post-1945, 1945, then it moves forward. It's this, it's this forward moving, progressive moving, it's more like a modern, it's like it's like the plane. You know, it's like four, four, tingling, tingling, tingling. It's moving forward, you know. And that's what this whole era represented. It represented um the new Negro. And it represented and, and these people when they when they went out, they dressed up. They didn't have on pants hanging behind off of their off of their behinds or 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 rag tied around their head. They dressed up. Mm. You know, if you notice the photo of my dad, he was dressed up. Yeah, he looked good. They went out dressed up. Well, let me tell you how I met the Heat brothers. I met the Heat brothers. In Actually, 19- if you wouldn't mind pausing, Larry, this sure. is this would be the perfect time to um, share this special thing we have for a kind of intermission. Okay, cool. And cool. when cool. we come out of that, I was hoping you would talk about precisely okay, cool. how you met okay. the Heat brothers. Um, we have a, a special guest with us tonight, Richard Sears, um, whom I got connected with through Carlos Case in the film studies department. And Richard is a pianist and composer. He's based in New York, but he's in Paris right now. And he's performed with the Billy Hart Quartet, uh, Ravi Coltrane and and other jazz artists. His 2016 release, Alta Dina, features the legendary drummer, Albert Tootie Heath. Uh, performing with his sextet. The album earned four stars in Downbeat and was named one of the best releases of 2016. He's a current grantee of the American Composers Forum and um, and we welcome him. And and Richard, I was hoping you might just give us a, um, a sort of quick intro to the, to the footage we're about to watch. Absolutely. And first, Larry, what is so great to hear your history and hearing you talk about the Heath Brothers and sort of the adjacent community. Um, yeah. if it rounds out my own experience interviewing Tootie and- and oh my God. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. So it's, it was great to hear that, thank you. All right. um, I, uh, I lived in Los Angeles for many years and by coincidence, I was, my first apartment after college was, was a, like a 10 minute, drive from Tootie's house in Altadena and I had always known about Tootie and I had met him a few times when I was younger as a student and um and I always found it was my experience like studying jazz and playing jazz in Los Angeles was uh I I was kind of weird that the like this jazz legend lived in the hills and you never saw him around. Like what, that's it's so strange to me. Like this guy played with Monk. This guy played with Coltrane. This guy knew Miles. Why, how come, where, where is he? <laughs> and I have a dear friend named Max Wrightson who um, was about my age. And he, he, uh, he studied with Tootie when he was a teenager. And, I was, and so, you know, Max and I were talking about this and it's like, and and to Max facilitated an opportunity with the Los Angeles Jazz Society where I would be essentially writing music for my ensemble as a way of paying tribute to Tootie. And it would, of course, it would feature Tootie as well for the debut performance. Um, in, pre- in preparing for that, um, I spent a lot of time just having lunch with him and going to his house, take him for a drive, we would hang out. And the, the, the thing that really, um, it was always fun, but the thing that really uh, made me realize that this was like, this is more than fun. Like this is learning and this is, this is a, a portal into history um, through you know, the generosity of a real legend. We would, we would be in his studio and he would just put on Ornette Coleman all day, all day. He loves Ornette Coleman. And he can sing the entire record, uh, Change of the Century. 
and others, but that was his favorite, Change of the Century, Ornette Coleman. He would just sing along with the whole record. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I feel like, and I've really missed this in COVID, but it's like, and Larry, you said, you said this really well. It's, it's jazz is a hard music to get into. It's a weird music and you kind of need to be initiated. And I think this is how it happens. You need to sit down with someone who's older and they need to show you why this is great music. And, you know, if that's a sibling, if that's your family member, your neighbor, whoever, and, and sitting down with Tootie and being like really initiated to 1960s free jazz um, and beyond was, was really something else. Um, and there, and that's, that motivated two sort of parts of, you know, my work with him, like the music that we were working, the music that I wrote was, I mean, I, I'm, I'll say this unabashedly, it's referencing Ornette Coleman throughout. And I wanted to give 2D the experience of like playing that way um, because it's not really part of how we see him as an artist. Um, you know, we typically associate with him with the Heath brothers and, you know, with hard bop and he is that drummer and he is that legend. But there was this other part of him that I felt like um, I wanted to explore working together. And then you'll see a clip of this in the, in the piece I made, but yeah, lots of recordings of him listening to music. Mm. Just the cameras on 2D, we're listening to his friends. We, lis we listened to Cliff Jordan and Ken uh, Kenny Dorham a ton. Mm. Uh, we listened to this record, Change of the Century. And the cameras just focus on 2D. And it's some of my favorite footage in the entire uh, that, that I've collected so far. That's wonderful. Well, I, yeah. I can't wait. I'm, we can't wait to see it yeah, when it's finished. Let's, let's check out this five minutes of, um, of um, footage. I, I, I've seen a little bit of it and it's, and it's wonderful. So this is, two, this is 2D Heath. Uh, we're, we're, we're listening to, for those of you out there. Percy Heath, Horace Silver, Milt Jackson, Charlie Percy. See them guys? That's Percy on the end. Yeah, Percy was the king, because, you know, Percy was a brilliant motherfucker. I'm just regular idiot. But Percy, that's what Jimmy, that was Jimmy's problem, I swear. Percy was so much into shit. Percy could fix cars. He knew how to fix a fucking engine. I don't know how he got this shit. He, could, he had old raggedy ass cars, and the next thing I know, they'd be driving. He was cold, man. Then he went from that to being a goddamn Tuskegee Airman. Right. That fucked my father up so much, boy. <laughs> He'd go out in the street and they'd be walking. He wouldn't walk with me, you know, because I'm a little brother, man. I couldn't be more than 12, 11. He don't want to go nowhere with me. So my dad would take him and I, I could see him. Come on, Percy, let's go. And they would go out and walk in the neighborhood and the white kids that were in the army, yeah. when they saw the lieutenant, yeah. black one, their mothers, <laughs> they be standing, my father, hey, Percy, they got one of them guys. <laughs> and Percy would look at the guy and do like this, yeah. and the guy would go at ease. But when the lieutenant came by, them guys, my father, hey, Percy, they be way across the street. <laughs> Hey, Percy, the old guy, he loved that shit. <laughs> I mean, he loved that. Percy and Jimmy and my sister, they all went to school in Wilmington, North Carolina. And because they were raised in my grandmother's house. So they all got a serious black education because they only had black teachers in the black schools down there. They weren't integrated. But when I when my parents moved to Philadelphia, they took me to Philadelphia from down there. So when I got to Philadelphia, I was at the age I should be in school, you know. So I went to the integrated school, 
and there was maybe three or four black kids in the class and for a teacher to and the teacher was a white teacher and the teacher didn't care to direct anything towards us because we were the minority people in the, in the classroom so we didn't get no history we got european history we got european everything we didn't get black history in the united states we didn't know about slaves and none of that they didn't teach us any of that but i learned all of that since i've been with my wife 43 years he said, oh, he ain't going home. Hillbilly shit, boy. Charlie Hayden. Oh, to beat that thing. He in hell. Coltrane, I don't think he's in hell. I really don't. And I don't believe in that. None of that shit. Ain't no heaven, ain't no hell. But wherever it is nice, he's there. He was a sweetheart, man. He was a little different. So I told my brother, we went to his house in Atlanta. Supposed to be his 61st wedding, not uh, marriage to uh, Mona. They've been married 61 years, and they were celebrating the 61st anniversary. And he laying up on the hospital bed because he's he's fucked up totally, and he can't talk no more. So he's making signs like two thumbs. So I said he knew he knew we were all in the house. Bastard. Now there's a picture of he and I standing on a step in North Carolina in my grandmother's house. And I'm in this, he's on the step behind me, and I'm down here, and I'm like about eight or nine years old, and I'm taller than him. And I call him a little bastard. I say, Look, you little bastard. Because <laughs> I used to always call him a little short bastard. <laughs> Wow. He's a funny guy, man. That was wonderful. Oh, Excuse my French. <laughs> yeah. No, we're past that. <laughs> I, I met him. So, so, Larry, now, you know, everybody having seen that, now now tell us about how you met well, them. Well, I, I met them officially in, in, in uh, Hampton, Virginia in 1968. Hampton, Virginia, Hampton, it was Hampton Institute at that time. And they, had, they have a jazz festival every year. It, 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 they've kind of digressed now. It's not what it used to be. It's more R&B now. But I went up there to see West Montgomery. And West Montgomery passed, I think a week or so before, uh, before the gig. So they got the Heath Brothers. So I went backstage and I said, hey man, I'm from Wilmington. And Jimmy said, hey man, and Jimmy was a comedian. They were, all three of them are comedians now. I mean, but I, Jimmy and, and Tootie would have contests to see who was the funniest one. <laughs> you can imagine how that went. So anyway, and, and they used that MF word all the time. I mean, Miles Davis used it all the time. So, so Jimmy said, hey man, he, he got the, uh, Tootie and Percy. He said, this guy's from Wilmington, man. <laughs> he said, he said and, and Jimmy said, they let you out. <laughs> and, so, and so he gave me his card and everything. And you know, I would go to New York all the time. I would go by the town. So when I started working, I worked at the public radio station in Wilmington for almost 10 years. From 1984, when they first came on here at WHQR, I was the evening jazz host there. From uh, 1984 to about 1993. So 
I decided that I was going to bring Jimmy to town and do it. I got a poster on the wall here now. I was going to do the Jimmy Heath homecoming concert. You know, let him know that he was a classmate of uh, 1945 graduate Wilson and a lot of his classmates came out and everything. So I brought him to what? No, I'll tell you what happened before then. Before then, when I got back to Wilmington, I was working at the, at the public radio station. I went out to UNCW, talked to the people in the fine arts department. I said, well, listen, the Heath brothers have a connection to Wilmington. We should bring them to town. And so this girl, woman, or student who was a total airhead, she said to me, she said, don't nobody know anything about the Heath brothers. I don't think that would be profitable to do. So I said, okay. Lo and behold, which is what they always do in Wilmington, they took my idea and bought the Heath brothers, they contacted the Heath brothers agent and arranged to have the Heath brothers to come to Wilmington. When I found out about it, I got all my boys together. We made a big, a, a homemade banner, met them at the airport and said, welcome home, Heath brothers. Mm -hmm. This must have been in 80. 84, 80, 84. Senator Luther Jordan at that time was not the senator, he was the mayor pro tem. We got Luther, because I went to high school with Luther, I knew Luther, we were in Cub Scouts together. We got Luther to, to declare it the Heath Brothers Day. Mm. It was the Heath Brothers Day and he presented the proclamation to the Heath Brothers. And there we have this photo of them at, com, coming off the plane at the airport, they're lined up. And, and, and because people knew who Percy was and knew who they were, people were from the TV station, the, the newspaper station, newspaper people were there, the press was there, right? It was all on the news and everything. And the, the concert was very successful. Mm. It went over big time. And they had, the pit, they had this banner, my boys had the banner, welcome home to Heath Brothers. The next day, there was an article in the paper. A reporter came up to Jimmy and said, what's the difference in Wilmington now than when you were here in the 40s? Jimmy said, I'll tell you the difference. Because Jimmy, Jimmy was actually smarter than Percy, in my opinion. Hmm. And he never went to college. He became a professor later on. And Jimmy said, I'll tell you what the difference was or is. If I'd have gone in the wrong neighborhood when I was here in the 1940s, I would have been called a nigger. Mm -hmm. And so the guy, the reporter, the reporter mm -hmm. wasn't expecting that. And so, but but Jimmy was Jimmy was on point. He was always like that. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he went straight to the chase. It's interesting though. He's we married to Jimmy was married to a European, and so was Percy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tootie lived in Europe for a long time. He lived over in Copenhagen, but I think about twelve years. Mm -hmm. I think he was married to a European too. His first wife was. It was he, I visited him in LA. He lived in LA. It was I, interesting. I visited him in, in, the, in LA. The footage when um, when 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 Tootie said that he felt like Jimmy had gotten a black education at at right. that right. he hadn't that he right. hadn't received in right. Philadelphia. The the power of Wilming, of Williston rather as a cultural institution is kind of it's it's awesome. Yeah, um, man. Yeah. They taught them French. They had mm -hmm. French teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they had excellence teachers because it was like a close knit family. Because if you got out of line, the teachers knew your parents. Mm -hmm. You know, so you get, and mm -hmm. they in those days they had corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. I, I think it kind of faded out when they got to the high school. Right. <laughs> but the other other grades, they would paddle you, man. So you you get a whipping. In school, and you get a whipping when you go home. <laughs> you know, um, and they taught, them, they taught them Shakespeare. Um, they taught them um, all the classics. Mm -hmm. They drilled that into them. They drilled that into them. You know, I went to Wilson one year. I graduated from New Hanover High School. Mm. My daughter is there now. New Hanover. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At that time, it was the largest school in the state. I came out in '67. Mm. Because it was the only high school in, in New Hanover County. But Wilson was an institution. And I tell you, relating to what happened in 1971 with the Wilmington 10, 
that was a big boo boo when they closed down Williston because it it took the heart out of the black community, and that was to me that was one of the factors that led to what 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 the historians call and my advisor said said to call the Wilmington incident. Mm. I call it the Wilmington ten incident of 1971. Uh, there were two deaths, uh, over half a million dollars worth of damage, fire bombings, looting. It was a it was a, a riot. But, but he chose to call it an incident. Mm. I think the closing of Wilmington was one, closing of Williston, excuse me, was one of the contributing factors that led to uh, what was eventually known as the Wilmington Ten. What do you do with that problem? Uh, you know, that, that um, in one sense, integration is a step forward for civil rights and, and ought to represent a kind of social you know, social progress, but in cases like this, it completely knocks the legs out from under um, a really important right. black educational institution that had a century of history behind no it. No question about it. I, I tell you a story about Williston. They, they, they gave a test to all the students in, in, in New Hanover County. And there were three, three students at Williston who scored higher than, than the Europeans at New Hanover High School. They made them take it over twice mm. <laughs> and they still scored higher this is how twisted people are you understand so but but that they have to close williston right Delphi high school in greensboro e smith in fayetteville west charlotte in charlotte because the, the African-American community wouldn't let them do that. They wouldn't let them close down their high schools. I see. So it didn't have to be done. But here-, so here That's a digression. Yeah, well, I, we could have a whole nother conversation about that. And I, and I hope we will eventually convene a panel on Williston on the history of it, which is totally fascinating. I mean, when you look at the list of people who came out of there, it's almost ridiculous. Right. Um, right. And, and then also talk about what, what happened and what is happening, because it, it's still fighting for its, for its integrity as a school. Listen, we're, it's, it's 731, so we've gone for an hour. So what I, what I would like to do um, before we solicit questions is... Oh, we have questions? We may. Let's see. I, I, I encourage all of you out there, if you have questions, um, to type them into the chat um during the next during the next five minutes and we can we can address them before we we have to stop but um you told us about the barn which is this um this legendary and and, and important music club where the where the true greats of jazz played and and wilmington was one of their stops you told us about the heath brothers this absolutely crucial um jazz family who, who, whose musical roots were in a very important way in Wilmington and, and um, who went on to, um, to change jazz. Uh, but there is this other story that I know you're also an expert on that is, that is just really weird, uh, but, all, but also has Wilmington jazz connections in an eccentric way. And that has to do with Lee Morgan. Can you, can you tell us who he is and how, how his story kind of entered your life? Lee Morgan was this extremely preteen, 12 and 13 years old from Philadelphia. Incidentally, Jimmy and Percy and all those guys knew him. Um, my understanding that, that um, he was so hot that he started playing Dizzy Gillespie at a, must have been age 16 or 17. Uh, he eventually ended up playing with Art Blakey. Art Blakey was a um, heroin addict. One of the things that Art Blakey did was he turned most of the musicians in his group on to heroin. And one of the musicians that he turned on to heroin was the very talented Lee Morgan. Uh, Lee Morgan became addicted to heroin. Um, Helen Morgan, who turned out to be a student in my class. Excuse my plug in my book. 
the lady who shot Lee Morgan, she was a, a middle age, I would say in her late 60s. I, well, I was teaching, of course, I had about three jobs. I was running a bookstore. I was the night evening jazz host at WHQR. And I was teaching uh, a Western civilization course at Shaw University, Cape. Shaw University is a African-American school that's based in Raleigh, but they have these satellites all over the state. There's one in Asheville, there's one over in Durham, there's one I think in Elizabeth City, there's about four or five of them. Mm. And there was one in Wilmington. She turned out to be one of my students. She was, she was, she used to sit on the front row. And as a way of introducing myself to the class, I had a bio because WHQR at that time had a little uh, booklet um, with pro programming guide. And they did a, 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 a bio page on me. So I Xeroxed it and I would give it to the people in my class to let them know to write their own bio. So right away when she read it, she said, oh, I love jazz. My husband was a jazz musician. And I said, really, what, what was your husband's name? And her last name was, she called herself Helen Morgan. And she said, my husband's name was Lee. I said, Lee Morgan, the trumpet player? <laughs> she said, yeah, that was my husband. I said, well, I would like to interview you one day. And she said, well, I'll think about it. So it took her maybe six years, because this was like in 1990. And I interviewed her in 1996, February of that year. And in March, 1996, she died. So this was like, a, I guess her last confession or something. And I went over to her home because I've done old history projects before I did old history projects when I studied the Wilmington 10. So I just put the tape recorder in front of her and she just talked for almost two hours mm. about how she met Lee Morgan, how she cleaned, she actually saved him. She met him one cold February and all he had on was a jacket. And there was snow on the ground in New York. She had actually moved to New York in 1945 in the midst of the, of the quote unquote bebop era. So she used to hang out with all these jazz musicians. She lived right around the corner from 52nd Street. Mm. She, she didn't move, to, when she moved to New York, she moved to what was called Hell's Kitchen, which is Midtown Manhattan. She didn't get, she didn't move to Harlem, which is incidentally where Thelonious Monk and a lot of African-Americans were living at that time. She was close to these clubs on 52nd Street. Mm -hmm. So whenever the jazz musicians would finish their gigs at three or four o'clock in the morning, they would come to her pad and she liked to cook. And so one, one morning she met Lee Morgan. He had on just a, a jacket and no overcoat or nothing. It was 20 degrees below zero, snow on the ground. And see, she, when she met him, she met him through another musician. She said, where's your overcoat, child? She called him a child. But she was like 12 years older than he was. So that's how she met me, Morgan. She, he said, my coat, overcoat is in the pawn shop. So she said, well, I'm gonna go get your coat. She said, I'm not gonna give you the money because you're taking to buy drugs with it. So what I will do is go get your coat out of the pawn shop. All this is in the book. And she, and she he said, you gonna get my coat out of the pawn shop? He said, yeah. So she got his coat out of the pawn shop. She said, where's your horn? And that's in the pawn shop too. So she got his horn out of the pawn shop, right? So after that, he moved in with her. And this is a quote. She said, she took over total control of Morgan's life. <laughs> she became his lover. She became his manager. She booked all his gigs. And so, that's how she became Mrs. Lee Morgan. She built, built up his career, uh, but eventually she ended up killing him because he started That's cutting out on her. <laughs> not the laugh, but I, I was about to say, yeah, the story is about to take a, a hard turn. Yeah, she eventually killed him. And, and then uh, she talked about that when I, when, I came, when I interviewed her at her house. But I was later able to write an article and I posted it on the internet and it went from here to Thailand and translated into several different languages. There was a Swedish guy named Casper Cullen, a filmmaker. And he read the article and he contacted me and wanted to know that I have a tape recording of the interview. And I told him, yeah. So he, we were able to come to an agreement. 
And he bought the rights to the interview. He used some excerpts of the interview in the movie, and the movie is called I Called Him Morgan. Right. And he actually stayed in my apartment here in Chapel Hill twice. He came over twice. The second time he came, the first, well, the, both of the times he came, he interviewed Helen's son, who's since passed. He lived down in um, Charlotte. Um, and the second time he came over, he said to me, he said, Larry, do you want to be in the movie? I said, I had planned on being in the movie. He said, well, you're an integral part of the story. So that's how I got in the movie. And there's actually some footage of Williston in the movie. Oh. So you but, know, I tell people all the time, you don't, you don't need to go to some exotic place like New York or Los Angeles or Paris to write your story. Mm -hmm. You can write your story right in your own backyard. So I've been blessed that all the stories that I've written about, I have three books, all three of my books are, are about my hometown mm -hmm. of Wilburn. There, there, there is so much unexcavated history here. Yes. Unusual. Yeah. It's a fascinating place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, has, it has unexpected um, importance in a lot of different areas. Yeah. And, and jazz is one. Yeah, it's a pirate. It's a, it's a pirate haven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The pirates love it down there. Now, um, the the circumstances of the murder when when Helen killed Lee Morgan were were quite dramatic, right? Right. How did it actually go down? Tell t tell the people. Well, he he started seeing this younger girl because she was like 12, 13 years older than he was. She had well, let me go back a bit. She had her first, she was actually from Shalote, North Carolina. Okay. She was not from Wilmington. She would later move to, uh, her mother moved to Wilmington. And so then her mother worked at the barn. Wow. She had her first child at 13. She had her second child at 14. She left them with her grandparents in Shalote and moved to Wilmington and started hanging out with a bootlegger in Wilmington. She married him at, 17, he was 39, mm. he died. She said he was, she said he drowned. In the oh. interview, when I interviewed her, she said he drowned. Her yes. son said that she told him that she stabbed him. Oh wow, oh wow. It's a hell of a story. It's a hell of a story, yeah. But that's the historian, you know, I found out there's one side, the other side, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I find it very hard to believe that. So, cause his, he was from New York. His family came down to Wilmington after the funeral and everything and took her to New York. Oh, okay. She got to New York. She got to New York in 1945. I see. All this is in the movie, yeah. right? Yeah. So when she took Lee in, I think she met Lee in the sixties. She'd already established a life in New York. When she took Lee in, he was still shooting drugs, man. You know, he, even after he got, because you take methadone and that kind of thing, even after he was on methadone, he was still shooting, you know, because when you're a junkie, you got to shoot something. Yeah, but that's really dangerous, right? When you Yeah, well, you know, and he has, he has a, a record called Speedball. Tootie's in the movie, too. Tootie knew him very well. Mm -hmm. Speedball is when you mix heroin and cocaine together. Mm -hmm. So Lee actually wrote a tune called Speedball. He was just consumed by drugs. So he started cutting out on her because they, she started aging, but they were living together. And she was booking all of his gigs. They were going to California. They were going to El, uh, San Francisco, Detroit, because she was booking the gigs. And he was concentrating on playing his trumpet. Mm. And he had reassembled another band. And she saved his life, you know? So what happened was he started cutting out on her and started dating a younger woman. No. And she couldn't take that because I, I tell you one of the first things she said to me during the, before the interview was, she said, you know, you know, you know, Larry, I don't know if I loved him or if I thought of him as my possession. Mm. And I, all this is on tape. You know, she yeah. said this on tape. <laughs> so I, now I said the same thing you said. I said, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, was, I thought that was kind of strange. But she, 
in moments like that, you just keep typing. You know? Well, I, I had a tape recorder. I just let it, you know, I just let, let it, it roll. Yeah. Yeah, it was a regular Sony. We um we're almost out of time, but before we stop, we have um we have some questions. Okay, let's do that because I I'd rather for them to read the book. Go look at yeah, the book. Well, yeah, I, let's go ahead and just um and just say that your work is is highly recommended for um Thank you. for anybody interested in Wilmington history, but also just for anybody interested in jazz history, period, and in black political history in the South. I mean, you you you've been doing this for decades. You've been a scholar of this. Thank you. Yeah. I try uh, to be a gentleman, a scholar, and a servant of the people. I've never thought it would be otherwise. <laughs> uh, let's see. Someone asks um, if you would remind us where exactly the barn was located. 11th and Mez. 11th and Mez. South 11th and Mez. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Near, okay. I know right where that is. And is there anything left there? Where, where, no. where, okay, no structure of any kind. They probably tore it down. They did. Yeah, it was in ruins. Wow. In ruins when I, uh, when I was a kid. Because I, like I said, I grew up on Rice Street between 4th and 13th. Mm -hmm. And we used to go to the store and on the way to the store, we would see it, you know. And you knew. The ruins and I would ask my dad about it. I'm sorry. You knew, you knew what it was, you know, what it happened. I didn't know what it was. I, well, I asked several people about it and they said well it was the barn that's mm -hmm. where the barn was and um it was where they had dance dances i mean these people would dress up man mm -hmm. you know they would put up it would um it was like you know what i call the saturday night function is the saturday night function and the sunday morning function right yeah <laughs> the church function yeah, they wear the same clothes um let me let me ask you kind of a, a a question as as a fellow researcher, although somebody who obviously hasn't gone as far into this as you have, um, it's really hard to find material on the barn from that period. I've noticed, and it's it's almost you know mentions of it are almost totally absent from the white Wilmington newspapers at 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 that time. Even though these big acts were coming through and playing, and I was wondering if you where you go for your information on, on the barn? Well, I've interviewed several people. Uh, when the Wilmington Journal was, was, was headed by the old man, I call him the old man, Thomas C. Jervie. When I came back to Wilmington, uh, incidentally, I'm working on a book. My, my latest book is called The Carolina Jazz Connection. And I also um, have a PowerPoint presentation called The Carolina Jazz Connection because there were, there were over 75 jazz musicians who were born in North Carolina. You know, John Coltrane, Th Thelonious Monk, uh, Max Roach, and Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. But there are over 75 who, has who have roots who were born here. So within that PowerPoint presentation and, and within my next book, I have a section on the barn. I've interviewed three people. I have the videos of them. There was an elderly lady. I don't know if she's still living. Her name was Boykins. Forget her first name. She recalled as a teenager going to the barn. Mm. And I interviewed a, a gentleman named Robert, Robbie Robinson, a musician who as a teenager recalled going to the barn. But I have amassed a lot of stuff on the barn and, and hopefully when I get a chance to publish my next book, it'll be in there. Um, but the old man, Thomas Derby, had all these old newspapers, but I understand they had some kind of damage that occurred there and all the newspapers got wet Oh. And they threw most of them away, and and so it's. it's but, you're, but you're but you're saying that those those probably would have contained the kind of writing we're talking about. Average. Well, not necessarily the writing, but they would have contained uh, that newspaper clipping, the advertising I gave you about Lionel Hampton. Yeah, I, that's where I got that from. There was another there's another newspaper advertisement about Buddy Johnson. Buddy Johnson used to appear appear there a lot, that's but they true. all were there. The Buddy Johnson big band. Wow. The big bands, see the big bands were touring, they would leave New York because of competition in New York was too tough. So they would come south. They would go to Washington DC, they would go to Richmond, Durham. My dad talked about all the big bands used to pass through Durham when he was in college. Mm -hmm. They stopped in Fayetteville, they would go to Kinston. Right. Because see, Kinston is close to, Kinston is a place where a lot of music was going on too. 
uh, Maceo Park is from Kinston. They have, because it's close to the Marine Corps base. And the Marine Corps base at Camp June has all, they would have these guys who are from the North. And so they, and the Marines would come to Wilmington too. So they would stop in Wilmington. They would leave Wilmington and go to Charleston and other places to perform. Hmm. These big bands. I talked to Dexter Gordon one time. He said that he recalled going to Rocky Mountain. They played in a tobacco bar. Wow. The real <laughs> barn, not the barn. The real barn. Yeah. Fascinating um, story, man. We have some more some more good questions, but um, we've gone 20 minutes over, I feel. Maybe okay. we can do, do one more for those diehards who are hanging on. Um, I could talk to you all night about this stuff, Larry. And Richard, I want to say it's been it's been so cool to have you. Yeah, man, I enjoyed that. I really it did. Was a, was uh, a, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. And yeah, Larry, pleased to meet you virtually here. And you no, know, he's in New Mexico now. Tootie's in New he, Mexico now. He's in New Mexico. I know he got vaccinated. I talked to him the other day. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. kind of weak now, you know, because he had a uh, he had a stroke. Indeed. Yeah. yeah two heart attacks. But he got that money, you know, that twenty-five thousand uh, fellowship. Indeed. And actually, you know, if I could make a plug for Tootie on his behalf. Uh, the San Francisco Jazz Festival is presenting the National Jazz Award, right. Right. Uh, National, sorry, National Endowment of the Art Jazz Master Award on April 21st. And it's a pretty incredible program, which includes 2D um, and then another, uh, Phil Schaap, who's a great historian and radio Oh, that's host. my man. I like Phil. Um, uh, I and then Phil. Henry Threadgill of the AACM Chicago scene. Yeah, man. Uh, so yeah, very cool people happening. Yeah. Uh, Jim, uh, Percy's, I mean, Tootie's actually on a new album by this guitar player. Have you seen it with Ron, Ron Carter and Tootie? Indeed, yeah. You know, in fact, um, the- You the, know, the guy, Greg, somebody. Uh, don't know him personally, but it was recorded a day after the, the session we had with Billy Hart. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, man. Um, um, my son- asks very, uh, and this is an interesting question, what, what the earlier venues in Wilmington were the places where people would have been playing in, in you know, 1900, 1910. Um, and and there, were, there were multiple vaudeville theaters in yeah. Wilmington. Mental shows, Silas yeah. Green, Silas Green passed through Wilmington quite a bit. Yeah, I th I probably we could, if we knew who all had been here, it would be a list of blues greats, every bit as impressive as the list of jazz greats who come, yeah. To, yeah. come to later. But you finding finding information on that stuff can be, yeah. can be hard. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, one more is oh oh well, um, Doty Levy. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Says. Uh, Tell about your playing saxophone in Wilmington and about Rudy and Cynthia Tyson. That may have to be another another. It's not me. It's, she talk, they're talking about my brother. Oh, okay. All right. Rod, Rod Thomas, Roger Thomas Jr. Got gotcha. you. Second. He didn't like to be called Junior. Okay. My brother. <laughs> second. I'm a talker. Yeah. I talk. <laughs> I don't play anything, but my mouth. <laughs> well, listen. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Richard, and and thanks. Thank you, to, John. Thanks to UNCW and the and the Equity Institute, and um, and for all of you who tuned in. That was that was really special. All right, great. Take care. See you soon. See you, brother. Yeah. Peace. All right. I'm interested in checking out the chat over here. Oh yeah, cool. We'll we'll leave it up. Leave it up. See you later. See you, Larry. All right. Be cool. You See too. You. Bye-bye.